flower in bloom But she's all around She lights up the room There we go Hi everybody, welcome to Two Awake Blondes I'm here with Lauren Hope Glory And we're going to discuss her channel, Moving On TV which um, and also her book and her theatre company got a lot of projects on the go, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> so where should we start? Should we start with um, we've got the book there in the background. Should we start with mm -hmm. that? Could do, yeah. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about this book, Simply Amazing? Of course, yeah. Well, Simply Amazing is a book that was written by Casey Armstrong, and it was written um, about three years ago I think yeah something like that and I'm in it I'm chap more my story is in it I'm chapter eight artist and performer overcame her childhood abuse and borderline personality disorder to launch a creative conglomerate of businesses and speaking engagements and singing about mental health through dedication to the drug-free world within the therapeutic community so that's basically what Casey store the story that has gone in there is the experience that I had in the therapeutic community that helped me recover more or less 100% from uh, borderline personality disorder and set me on my journey of creating Moving On Theatre and then Moving On TV in 2014, which I took back in the lockdown and haven't stopped since. <laughs> I know you've really been on the go. You've been doing a lot of stuff. It's quite impressive. Um, so could you just talk us through a little bit like what was it like before the therapeutic community and what was it like after and the sort of okay. transformation, the shift that happened? Okay. Um, right. So before the therapeutic community, um, there we go. Before the therapeutic community, um, I had a huge amount of issues. So my whole life was, I was broken. I was completely broken. I got to the point where I couldn't be with friends anymore because I was jealous of everybody. Um, I got myself arrested for panic attack uh, once, thrown, thrown in a cell because I was having a panic attack on the street. Um, and they followed me. Um, and because I wouldn't let them into the house, they ended up arresting me because I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't control my rage. I couldn't, I couldn't work. I couldn't run theater because the minute I'd arrived, people would say the ego has landed. And so I had the bad name that way. <laughs> the ego has landed. And um, it was, yeah, life wasn't really working at all. So. I was kind of on my knees. I, I didn't know what to do. My mother had died and my husband was working a lot. I couldn't sort myself out at all. And um, so I went to the doctor and I said, you know, I, at that point, I didn't know what to do anymore. So I thought, I'll go and see a doctor. And, he, and that was it. I got a diagnosis and it helped me to move on to where I needed to go in some ways, but in other ways it's also held me back. So, but yeah, that, that I was before the community. I couldn't have a conversation. People used to say that I would start on one subject and then I'd be 20 different subjects at the same time. So I couldn't focus, I couldn't explain myself properly. Mm -hmm. absolutely no empathy so I couldn't put myself in anybody's shoes ever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wasn't capable of doing that in any way shape or form um yeah so it was, and, and this was basically the result the result of growing up of growing up in Israel in a war-torn from being a child growing up in a war-torn environment you had PTSD as well right yes I did um when I was seven years old, my family took me to Israel. And so my whole life was disrupted. And I remember from the minute I got there, I, I absolutely hated it. I didn't like it. I didn't feel like it was gonna work out. I was torn away from my friends and my community. And I grew up in wards and then there was childhood abuse. 
and yes, I, I believe that because I grew up in continuous wars, it's not a good way for a child to grow up where you can't sleep at night and you know, um, yeah, it caused a lot of post traumatic stress. And I, I'd like to think that this borderline personality disorder thing, because my research and all the work I do is actually post traumatic stress disorder rather than a serious mental illness. That's how it feels to me anyway. But yeah, a, a huge amount of uh, shock, I'd say. And I think shock is what causes you to not be able to live in this world and to have the breakdowns and not be able to communicate with other people because you're basically not able to, um, you don't have your feet on the ground. You're, you're being shook up. <laughs> you, know? you, you were actually you were traumatized you were traumatized as a child yeah yeah i was i was traumatized as a child and uh, i carried that into my adulthood um and i numbed it i numbed it all and i didn't realize that i had numbed all the pain because i wasn't allowed to be myself so the minute i came out of that the minute i left israel I was about 22, I think. That was it. Everything started to come up a little bit. But when I met my husband, that's when all the real stuff came up. Um, and I started training in, uh, with Reiki. And I realized that I'd been abused. And only over the last few years um, have I realized how much I was numb, even up to the beginning of the lockdown. So, how numb I was that I'd actually been numbed down I wasn't able to express anything that happened to me and it all came up in the last three months the beginning and you and you mentioned that you know for a long time you know you used food to kind of like stuff down the emotions and then was it around about age 32 that um, you had a breakthrough with that yes yeah I had a really interesting spiritual awakening and that was when I met my husband. Uh, he's never known me to have an eating disorder. And, and I was doing some work like journaling and trying to figure out when I, when I eat and when I want to eat and what's driving me to, to um, whatever it, this addiction was. And it just went away. It wow. completely disappeared. And um, I did start acting. <laughs> uh, I picked up acting and went on the stage and it could be that I swapped an addiction but it was amazing because before my husband knew me well, you've always you've always music. been had a talent you've always had a talent for singing mm -hmm. uh, so you already you, you had a natural performer inside of you that's been a natural talent that you had since you were young right um, I started, well I, I played the accordion from the age of six okay Dublin and my father used to put me in concerts, you know, I played in concerts and things like that. Uh, and then when we went to Israel, the age of 13, I was discovered as one of the lead soloists of the children's Sadikov, which was the main uh, national choir that used to go on TV and, and uh, everything. And I got three solos. So I had a solo career with a massive choir singing behind me somewhere over the rainbow. Wow. That if I could by Simon and Garfunkel and an Hebrew song. And I was in front of audiences with big orchestras and and sang in front of the Prime Minister, I think, as well. So yes, I had this musical talent. I had trained as a an accordion as a professional, and that's all I wanted to do. But it was the only thing that made me feel that I I, I mattered. The only time I felt I got any recognition was, mm. was singing. And of course, you know, I, I can't remember eating. Uh, the, the disorder was around the, more or less the same time as I stopped. The choir stopped. It's very interesting when I look at when my eating disorder got very bad was when the choir stopped because there was a war and we had to leave. And I think my parents didn't have the money to, to keep me there. And so, and also, um, a few things happened around the same time, and that's when the eating disorder became so bad around my, you know, when I got my periods. I think I, I, I remember telling you 
that in the Jewish religion, when you get your period, you get slapped across the face. Wow. Um, my mother, yeah, she said, oh, you've got, you're a woman. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> and so everything got worse after that. My right. disorder, my loneliness, um, because I wasn't singing, I wasn't performing. Uh, and also I think that, you know, that there's, you know, a lot of people grow up and they, I think, you know, I know from my own, ex you know, experience from hearing from other family members that this feeling of not being seen I, I think that was quite common, you know, uh, and we've seen huge leaps happen within, uh, you know, sort of psychology and, and, and transformation and counseling and all this sort of thing where, you know, we recognize that people need to, you know, children need to feel seen. And I think that, but unless their parents have been shown that, then often they don't really know how to do that for a child. And I think that there was a, you know, we came out of like the Victorian era where children were seen and not heard. And what that meant is that, uh, you know, basically children were supposed to behave, uh, whereas, you know, we're only just moving now into some sort of emotional intelligence with children. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do totally. Uh, and I totally agree with you. I wasn't seen. I wasn't heard. I wasn't allowed to be heard because I was brought up. My father used to blame me. For, I used to get blamed for everything. And because my mother was such a difficult person, you weren't allowed to be yourself around her. And so I was completely numb down and shut down. And to me, the recovery that I went through was all about validation. Validation was the most important thing. And in the therapeutic community, we had a bell, we had the validation bell. And people came in there, people that had never had any validation, all of us came in there together. And I used to ring the bell all the time. I sat on the floor. The first six months, I think I cried for about six months, just sat on the floor and cried and cried and cried and let everything out, maybe a little less than six months, and rang the bell every chance I got and took every moment of therapy. I was determined that I was going to sort this out. Um, but I think the other thing which can happen to you, which happened to me, when you don't have validation, you become very narcissistic. So it's all about you and everything's about you. There's no empathy. And Casey said to me in the interview when I said I had no empathy and he said, well, of course you didn't. You, nobody gave you any empathy. So how could you have any? How could you learn it? And in the community, I was taught to put myself in other people's shoes occasionally to be able to understand what empathy is. And because at times they would say to me I would just throw something out there and stir it up you know like the king's not wearing any clothes a bit like I do now maybe on tv but it's okay to do it now uh, but not then because everyone was so vulnerable and I had such power the people used to just run out they literally would run out crying because I'd throw something at them without realizing the damage I was causing. It wasn't the right uh -huh. to do it. And uh -huh. Because I didn't know any better. I, I mm -hmm. don't. Mm -hmm. So you can't. So I, I, I just wanted to say aware. actually that, yeah. you know, I went through a sort of a transformational journey. And what I learned on the journey is that when you bring things into awareness, it's kind of more in, along the Buddhist sort of um, uh, framework. Uh, but basically, you know, once once you brought it into, you know, as long as it's you're, you're unconscious of it, you can't really do anything about it. But when you bring things, you shine the light of awareness on things, then you bring it, you make it conscious. That's when you can ch you can do something about it. But a lot of the time, people are completely unaware. Yeah, uh, they're just walking around. They've got a massive blind spot, and they have, and everyone else can see it. But they, you know, they're just they haven't got a clue. I just wanted to throw that in there because um, mm. I totally agree. Um, about the blind spot it's really interesting and you can't you can't change it and you can't learn it until you're prepared to surrender and so the whole thing about the therapeutic community is you walk in and it said trust the process yeah and when you come from abusive backgrounds who's going to do that no one mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, a lot of us a lot of people got thrown out I, I nearly got thrown out four times because mm -hmm. I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know what I was doing wrong. 
uh, and it took quite a while for me to understand what it meant to trust the process. Um, but at some point I got it. Um, it was when they tried, tried to get rid of me the fourth time. And I was kind of in shock because I thought I was doing my work because I was doing my best. I did whatever I thought I, I knew. I, I did what I thought I knew, yes. which was yeah. the same as I was doing. And they say, oh, Lauren, you're on thin ice. And, we, you know, uh, and everyone sits around you and you think, right, this is it. I'm going. They've had it with me. And, and if I had been thrown out, I, I would, nothing would have changed. I wouldn't be here now. I think I would have been gone by now. Probably medicated up to the eyeballs. And because of the kind of body I have, that wouldn't have done me much good, you know? Have you, have you ever tried medication, any medication? Oh, um, oh, we're going back. About 20 years ago, I tried something and it, oh, I'll never forget it. We went to see a film. Um, oh, God, I'm just trying to think about the film. It doesn't matter. It was sad. And yeah. everyone was crying and I had no feelings. I was completely numb. And I thought, oh, I don't want this. So I threw it in the bin. That was it. Never touched anything after that. So I started a very long journey trying to learn whatever I could about using only natural methods. And bit by bit, I realized how sensitive my body was. And I thought, well, you know, um, when I, I went for my interview, before I got into the therapeutic community, I said to them, don't give me medication because I'm an actress as well. <laughs> I don't want to be numb. And I was so lucky. I believe that something looked after me. And I do believe that this happens on and off in my life. Uh, because the psychiatrist said to me, um, you, you work A Course in Miracles, don't you? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, you do understand the difference between the ego and, you know, and spirit and love. She said, would you like to try therapeutic community where you won't need to use medication and you'll have a 24-hour support system? That was it. When they said the 24-hour support system, I was sold, you know, and it was one of the most difficult experiences in my life. And I believe um, I went through a huge dark night of the soul when I lost my dad and my family cut me off and ended up in a wheelchair. And if it wasn't for, and the lockdowns, if it wasn't for the therapeutic community, I don't think I would have gone through this. I don't think I would have coped with this at all. Um, it completely changed my life and shifted me in such a way. But as I was saying, uh, you don't know what's wrong with you until you have an awakening. And, and that day that they tried to get rid of me, I was in shock because I really didn't understand what I was doing wrong. And I remember they didn't get rid of me. I was very lucky. And the staff kept me. They must have seen beyond. I, I, I thank them every day. I'm one guardian angel who stood up for me. And I remember I was driving home on the way home and I kept thinking, yeah. um, why does that Sorry, it's a bit unconventional, but I'm gonna, gonna go like this instead, yeah. Thank you. Why, <laughs> <laughs> why does everybody hate me? It was kind of like, why? And I couldn't figure it out, you know, and it was like, what's wrong with me? Why are they trying to get rid of me? There must be something wrong with me. You know, I'm doing something here because I'm starting to realize, you know, there's something here. Apart from the politics and the pack therapy, the pack mentality, I knew that there's something wrong here. So I remember going home that night and I went to bed and I had a massive night terror. And I grabbed hold of my husband and I said, don't let me go back. And that was it. I suddenly had a light bulb and it reminded me that I had asked my, my father, my mother and my father, don't send me back to the dentist who's actually molesting me. Mm -hmm. I suddenly realized, well, it's not my fault. Mm. I didn't even know that I was carrying all this guilt inside me. And then the magic happened. It happened just the next day. I woke up the next day and I had no BPD. Mm -hmm. Completely in, in a piece. And uh, nothing. yes, I've had... Um, times where I go back into it because abuse is, is layers mm -hmm. you have to keep removing the layers and there's been times when it's uh, come back in different ways 
uh, particularly when I was in the wheelchair as well. You know, it was a really difficult time. And that I mean, and and I, I know that BPD can be like it can be sort of like little bits of all different, uh, you know, mental health uh, disorders. But in a nutshell, if you had to try and sum it up, um, how would you describe what what it is? What is BPD? <laughs> Okay, well, I'll do it with a song I've written for Encounters. I think that's <laughs> do it. Um, because, and the way I'll explain it, how Vince, the character in Encounters, which is the musical I'm writing about the therapeutic community and mental health recovery, comes into it. Um, he explains it, okay? He comes back from the doctor and the doctor says to him, um, okay, this is what's wrong with you. You've got borderline personality disorder or complex needs disorder, whichever way you want to look at it. And he said, well, I, what does that mean? And he says, the doctor says, well, you remember when you could go to Woolworths and you'd get your pick and mix? You'd have some Dolly mixtures, some, you know, mm. a bit of this, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Oh, this, God, yeah. <laughs> God, I remember that. So it's all gone. That's what BPD is. Um, it's a complex needs disorder. So this is the song, okay? A little bit of agoraphobia, a little bit of OCD, a little bit of claustrophobia, that's BPD. A little or a lot of depression, lace with it's all about me, narcissism. <laughs> Tourette's, Tourette's, now up comes next, that's BPD. <laughs> a little bit of autism. A little bit of AD or ADHD, a cup of paranoia. Are you looking at me? That's BPD. <laughs> now add in schizoid tendencies and make it all about me. Narcissism. <laughs> a spoon of manic states, got on our plates with a monkey brain that I cannot train. That's BPD. It's all about me. Brilliant. CD. That's brilliant. And PTSD. CPD. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I listen. I really want to. I want to. Really want to. I really want to applaud you uh, for you know being so open about this stuff because I'm sure that by being you know talking about it, that's what we need to do, don't we? We need to just bring this into the open, right? Definitely, definitely. Since I walked away from the therapeutic community. All I've done is try to talk about the therapeutic community and recovery from borderline personality disorder. I created the book. I created the cards, how to stay sane in a crazy world, um, which people are upside down. See, that's what I admire and about, today. you know, <laughs> you guys, you're still quite able to be quite productive though, aren't you? Because I mean, you know, I think with depression, the problem with depression is that like, you know, I've suffered from depression myself. And, you know, you just can't really get your head above water to do much, you know? Okay. But, but with, with, by, with, with, I've noticed that you guys can it's be actually be quite, quite creative and quite productive, can't you? Okay, I need, I need to, again, it's not bipolar. The thing is, with BPD, you have the traits of the extreme black and white traits. Like, in the community, we had one woman... If, um, and they used to get the same cheese every time when we went shopping. And one day I said to her, can I have feta? And she, she just blew up. You can't have feta? How can you have feta? We've got to have this, exactly this, exactly. And I thought, yeah. hold on a second. Okay, it's not bipolar, it's something completely different. BPD has the traits of yes. bipolar. Now, talking about depression, I suffer a lot from depression. But the depression I suffer from is usually when I feel grief and it's usually brought on when I can't find anything to do that I love. And I have been in states like this. Remember, before I took over moving on TV, I, did, I couldn't edit. So I had to teach myself. So I couldn't do very much. And um, there's been loads of times in my life when I haven't been able to perform because theatres were too expensive or... I just couldn't get my work out there in any way. And so my depression comes on when I'm stuck. But nowadays I know how to, I, I will go into meditation and I'll always find something tiny. I also trained as a life coach to be able to do something very, very small. But believe me, I mean, 
after my father died and my family cut me off, we, I used to go to the positivity center and I sat, I just cried continuously. Paul at McDonald was saying that how much I've shifted in three years. He said, all I used to do is sit there crying and, oh my God, I miss my family. And that was it. My whole life was round in circles. I couldn't come out of it. I couldn't come out of it. The lockdown and all of the changes in the world have pushed me into such power. I really feel I've, I've come into my, my power and, and everything. I'm just working continuously, but I'm not even thinking about the money and the consequences and how many likes or subscriptions. I've completely given that up because that can easily push me into the... Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I've got, to, I've got to applaud you for the fact that, you know, really, you've got to put... I mean, put, all of us, as long as we're stuck in this validation trap, you know, of, of social media where we're comparing ourselves and the likes, and I know that, you know, I found that very, you know, difficult myself, but if you can, if you can just like sort of push past that, that's the, that's the trick, isn't it? Because as long as we're stuck and what I find is that I can kind of like pretend that I don't care, but I do care. So I always end up kind of like, it ends up pulling me down, you know? Mm. I've had to let go of that because um, it will stop me. Um, I know if I keep watching and thinking, well, what I keep telling myself is I'm looking at mentors, people that have, it's taken a while for them to build their empire. So people like Ralph Smart, for example, he puts a video on every single day and he's probably been doing it now for about three years, two to three yeah. years. I've been doing it for 30 days. And so, you know, yeah. difference. I started in 2014, but I was never consistent. And to me, the answer, I mean, don't get me wrong, when I've done a show and I've been consistent, I sold out Edinburgh. I sold out the fringes. When I was good, when I am consistent, I move mountains. But I always gave up in the end because I always, you know, there was something that stopped me. But now I've decided I'm, like uh, Sifu Bogi said, put something on Instagram every single day, every single day, a few minutes, I do that. I leave it, I get on, I do something else, I do something else, I do something else. Because I know how sensitive I am. I know that personality that is sensitive will sabotage everything and it won't let me move forward if I start and worrying about I haven't got enough subscribers or this, that and the other. At this point, I'm just building and building and creating and creating. And I have to, I have to sit with it sometimes because um, the fear comes up and it's like, oh, you're not getting anywhere. But of course I'm getting anywhere, somewhere because, again, someone said to me, if one person watches your program and they send you a message and say, you made me feel good today, isn't that enough? Yeah. Why shouldn't it be enough? And I'm in a position at the moment where I got a lottery grant. I'm still waiting for the money. So I can survive, you know, financially a little bit and uh, do my work but i do believe that this will take off i, I know every bone in my body that me I, I believe it now and it's taken to this new consciousness this new awakening consciousness yes yeah, so i wanted to ask you about the, this Definitely awakening okay um do you i mean i know that there's been times where you've been you know sort of quite bold and brave on social media and there's been a backlash um how do you uh sort of you seem to just it seems to be waters off a duck, duck's back. It doesn't seem to really get to you. I can't, I won't let it get to me, Angie, because my whole family cut me off. As I say, when you go through something, when you lose your whole family, you lose a, a, a yeah. wheelchair, and you just, I, I just basically, the, the brilliant thing that came from that, I got a little bit angry. And I got a bit sad about it because I was doing very positive meditations on there as well. But I, I picked up moving on TV instead. So that's the silver lining. I hadn't done it for God knows. I don't remember the last time I did an interview on moving on TV. We're talking about years. So I picked it up again and I thought, right, this is it. I'm going for it now. I'm the truth media. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do what I love. So you find the silver lining. And of course, I also had Hope Glory Productions. Hope Glory, which is my other Facebook, 
with not that many friends on it because my other Facebook, I've got about 4,000. But you know what? Trump has taken over social media, so all that's going to end and we're all going to get our sites back and, and it's extraordinary. But yeah, I, I'm not going to, I wouldn't let myself get into that. And one of the people that's given me, uh, well, Martin, my husband, gives me loads of uh, encouragement, but I'd say Paul MacDonald um, has given me a huge amount of courage and a huge amount of encouragement to go out there and to do this. I felt in a way that he was my teacher and mentor. Yeah. In some way, I felt like I, I wanted to do these things in order to be able to raise myself to the levels he goes sometimes. And it started off a little bit like that, like kind of pleasing him. But then, you know, once I took it back, it was like it was all about getting on with it, getting on with my indigo, getting out there, doing what I love, and not worrying about anything except just every day getting up. And the other thing about it is structure. Like today, for example, is a good example. Structure is very, very important. And I think that's one of the reasons the therapeutic community works as well. For people like me, when, when I didn't have work and I didn't have kids and I didn't have structure. So you go there three days a week and you, you take care of the community. You have responsibilities. This is my work. So just my head is creative. So I just try to bring it back. So today was very interesting. I had an interview with someone called, uh, I was going to have an interview with Jack Edward Kidd to talk about Nasara and Jasara and the new King of England and all this incredible stuff. And he couldn't do it. So I thought, okay, I've got to have a backup plan. So I got on Facebook and I found someone called Charlie Ward. And they had just been together doing, you know, I knew they were connected. And he did an interview with me. And I said, you know, you've got to have a backup plan. And if that hadn't happened, I've got so much stuff to edit anyway. So um, I'm trying to, to stay focused. So, yeah. So after they cut me off Facebook, um, they cut me off for 50 days. I think I've got another 45 days to go. Uh, but then, as I say, things are changing. I'm not worried about it. I, I just thought, well, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to get my message out? And then it was, you're going to take back moving on TV. And that was it. I'm going to do a program called The Awakening every single day. And for 30 days, today is day 31, every single day, taking people from the dark into the light with, with the experiences that I've had in life. And I've done it. Every single day, I've put it on. I mean, sometimes I've sat up till 5 a.m. in the morning to make sure that I can get it on YouTube every single day. And that's what keeps me sane, I think. It's yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely something day. to be said for, uh, you know, when you actually step into your true self-expression, your, your authentic self-expression, that it, it, it does something. It, it gives you, it, it kind of, um, it, it, it puts you in your power in a way when you're, when you're doing that. And it, you know, it gives you strength, right? Completely. Um, I mean, some of the things I've done since, since I got cut off Facebook, uh, uh, cut off from um, doing Facebook Lives, was I, st I, I started to study tarot seriously. And I got my qualification <laughs> a couple of weeks. I did it really fast because I, I, I'm an intuitive psychic anyway. And I thought, okay, let's do the tarot show. And... I was like, this is my playground. Moving on TV is my playground. And, and not only that, writing, I've started to write the whole score for my musical. And I don't know where this all comes from. It's like when you're so tuned in, you, you're, the muses and just starts to come through you. I mean, I could never arrange piano for, for a musical. And I, but I, something's I, giving you this strength. It's like, <laughs> you know, like, uh, like nothing's really sort of like you're not getting phased do you know what I mean like you're just sort of like mm. powering through like you know for me like with the backlash that you had on social media um, that would have knocked me out for a few few weeks you know and I but with you you know it's like you're just like water off a duck's back you just sort of you don't care sorry I just turned that off um, it's not that I don't care 
Um, when it first happened, it pissed me off a lot because, as I say, I had I have 4,000 friends on there nearly, and I thought, I'm getting someone here. I was getting about 40 people joining in the meditations and because people were very frightened in the beginning. There was a lot of fear, and I felt my job was to do the meditations and to help people stay calm. But as I said, I, I, somehow I just thought, well, what am I going to do? I'm not going to sit here doing nothing. And then the idea came in, and I thought, well, I'll do a program daily called The Awakening, and I'll write the music for it. And that was it. It all fell into place. Something just helped me there. And I think it's my creativity is what keeps me going because it won't let me sink. Even when I was in the wheelchair, um, I started, I did some uh, program. I taught myself how to edit because I, that's when it was a time to think, I don't want anybody to feel like I do when, I, when they're in a wheelchair. I don't want people to be lonely. I was very, very lonely. A lot of my friends disappeared, <laughs> which was interesting. And I taught myself how to edit um, while I was in the wheelchair. And that's how I found Casey and went in the book because he said, oh, you didn't have a pity party. You got on with it. And that's why I want you in some <laughs> So I, I, I think this comes from my dad. I think it comes from dad. I think before dad died, you know, when he was 92 years old, I went to Israel. My dad had an extraordinary life. He always fell on the street. And I turned up and he, he had recorded his life story and called it A Cat Has Nine Lives. And it was all on tapes. He was 92. And he said, there's the tapes. I want you to write my book. You know, that's how dad was. I was his secretary, you know. That's how it used to be. And so I think a lot came from him. Because if a man of 92 can go out there and realize their dreams, what's stopping me? And he never let life get to him. And also the thing about he wouldn't take medicine. You know, he was very, very well until he fell. And since dad has moved on, I believe that he's with me in spirit. And I believe that he gave me. And I went on the night my father, the day my father died, he always said the show must go on. And I went on and I got a five-star review as Edith Piaf and I got a standing ovation that night because dad must, was there. He was there with me. I think, I feel it to a certain extent. I can't say for definite, but I do know that a lot of things happened, uh, strange things after dad died. But dad taught me, you never give up. Both my mother and father, my mother was very stubborn in lots of ways. My grandmother, I mean, my grandmother, God, my grandmother had the life from hell. She lost her beautiful son. He was 20. And he, he bent down to tie his shoelaces and that was it. He was a scholar. He was a genius. And my mother at 21 had to go and bring back his body from England to Ireland. And then my grandmother, my, they lost uh, my grandfather six months later. And she still carried on. My grandmother carried on regardless. And, and then you go back to the Jews, you know, my, my ancestors that came from Russia. And, you know, they came with all of it, being burnt out of their houses. I mean, there's all this strong genetics in me. And you never give up. You never give up. And that's why I changed my name when I came out of the therapeutic community to hope, Lauren Hope, because hope to me, without hope, you've got nothing. Hope is the first stage on the emotional balancing. Um, Esther Hicks talks about the law of attraction. Depression, and then a tiny bit of hope, and then you can go into other things. And then I added on the name Glory, because Paul said, Paul McDonald said to me one day, why don't you call yourself Lauren Glory? Because glory is getting everything. And I said, no, to me, without the hope, which is the stepping stone, you can't go into the glory. So then I became Lauren Hope Glory. So because I believe this is my ancestry. This is my genetics. That, and this is the BPD in inverted commas. If you have it and you use it in a positive way, you can have a wonderful, wonderful life. I, I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm proud that I'm different. I'm proud that I'm different. I'm, it makes me creative. It makes me an indigo. It, it helps me 
to take charge in my life, even though there are things that I didn't know how to do that a lot of people can do, which I'm trying to learn, which is how to earn money. But, you know, that's more about balancing things and trying to learn these things. But to me, I celebrate the, to a certain extent, I celebrate the diagnosis because if I didn't have that diagnosis, I would never have gone into the therapeutic community because you only went in there when you had this condition. And I had to act my socks off, you know, I can say that now. Uh, in order to get into the community, I had to be a character because they wouldn't take me because I never shut up. <laughs> so I acted this character and it's so calm and gentle and they put me in the community. But as I said, but on the other hand, because of the consciousness that we're coming from, and I pray to God that it's gone now, um, I wasn't able to do a lot of things because of the stigma. I wasn't allowed to work. I wasn't able to get on the media. I wasn't able to move on in any way. The minute I started to give the message out that I'm not using drugs, every single charity more or less said to me, we want to sponsor you, we want to support you. And um, I wasn't able to adopt. And it's something I really wanted to do because again, connected to my dad's life story, he was an orphan. Uh, he, he, he ended up in Vernon Beaches, was taken into a wonderful family. Amazing, amazing life story. That's another book, Cat of Nine Lives, <laughs> Dad's story. So, how, how old were you when you got the diagnosis? How old were you when you got the diagnosis? Ooh, I'm going to lie about my age now. <laughs> 10 years ago, let's put it that way. It was 10 years ago when I got diagnosed. And it's eight years now since I uh, left the therapeutic community. So. Yeah, I was diagnosed about 10 years ago. And again, you could look at it as a total misdiagnosis because my mother, my mother had died a few years before. Uh, as I said, uh, my husband was working all the time. The menopause starts, early menopause. Uh, I had a very early menopause, uh, regardless of the age thing. And, um, and as I say, to me, if it had been hol more holistic, if they had looked at it in a more holistic way, they would have given me probably minerals and changed my diet. And, you know, I did a lot of work on myself with that as well to heal my symptoms in different ways, with gluten-free and dairy-free. But ideally, holistically, they would have taken care of it. But as I say, I'm grateful because I don't think it would have been good for me now in lockdown. I've got all the time in the world to put into this passion of mine, media and writing encounters. And if I'd had kids or grandkids, then my life would have been completely split around all over the place. And so I, I, I'm starting to believe that something knows better. And I just need to trust that there is something there. Yeah. So if, coming from your psychic intuitive sort of point of view, how do you see the future now? Do you see a bright future for humanity? <laughs> okay, this is really fascinating um, because I did an interview today with Charlie Ward and, and he was talking about everything. Now, this is how I see it. Um, I feel, yes, I think there's a beautiful new awakening happening a new consciousness where masses of people are waking up i do see it coming but not yet i think we've got work to do and i think there's a there is a lot of work to do um i think that because we're winning the other part that isn't is fighting back and they will fight back um and i think but i i personally think that after the elections when trump is in again um, then we're going to start to see amazing results. And uh, I'm starting to feel it, not just because I've been feeling it for a while, but because I've been watching people, particularly there's a lot on YouTube now about this Nasara, Gisara thing, which I'm trying to figure out. One is English and one is American, where the Federal Reserve is gone and where bartering is going to come in. And uh, people apparently are going to be, mortgages are going to disappear. Uh, taxes are going to become very small so basically humanity are going to get their lives back because we were we were we were cheated we were cheated 
in the so what is it like on an individual basis is there anything people can do do they need to do their inner work what what is it that people mm -hmm. you know what is it that, okay. that an individual can do at the moment okay well i feel that there's a hell of a lot of work to do it's not you can't just i i don't believe just sitting there meditating is going to fix this you've got to sign petitions definitely you've got to sign petition 5g is very dangerous i know and i feel it i tell you why i feel it because i've only got 4g on my phone and i was so sick the other day and i've had incidents like this i couldn't my head i was dizzy we had to turn everything off, everything off, because I held the phone for over an hour and I was so sick. And that's 4G. Now, I, I believe a 5G is very, very dangerous and it's going to really lower immune, people's immune systems. There's a lot of controversy going on around uh, 5G and I can't say too much because I don't know enough myself, but I do believe 100% that we can stop it. That people power, we have to sign petitions. We have to stand up for ourselves and say no. Now, at some point, it's all going to go because, as I say, the new world, and I'm not talking about the new world order, I'm talking about a beautiful, equal new world without that lot is coming in where 5G is not going to happen. But happening at the moment, because it's a good weapon to hurt us to lower our immune systems even more and to do things to us. It's, 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 it's just, you know, when you're fighting, I mean, of course, the miracle says, you know, the more you, you know, if you're defending yourself, you're going to be attacked because the enemy, all they know how to do is to attack, to defend themselves. They don't know anything else. They don't have any... But do you believe, like, you know, with the Buddhist monks, you know, like, mind never matter, you know, they could sort of, like, you know, stay warm in minus temperatures and, you know, do you think that, like... You know, if we believe that and then we're kind of like buying into the fear of it, then it's kind of be a self-fulfilling manifestation. Whereas, you know, if we don't, then it's kind of mind over matter. Do you know what I mean? I do believe in mind over matter. Uh, like the same way I believe that every single disease is curable. However, you have to get to that level. And I don't think I'm there. <laughs> and I don't think a lot of us are there. I think most of us are not there. But yeah, I do believe you can get there, but it would take a huge amount of work uh, to get to a level where you're going to feel that you're going to cope with this. I mean, I'm surprised at how ill I feel sometimes and how quickly it happens. It's not like I plan it. Um, we got Wi-Fi put in years ago and I didn't even have time to think about it and I was rushing to the loop. I mean, take, for example, vaccines. You know, there are a lot of people that, that they get their kids vac vaccinated. I mean, I think my sister's vaccinated her children. They're fine. There's no issue with it. And then there are other people that it's devastating for. Yeah. Um, you know, so again, you know, it's like, how do we explain these things? Do you know what I mean? Like, why... Um, do some people get destroyed by it and other people just sail through it? You know what I mean? Yes, I can understand that. Well, there's a couple of things, Angie, I'd say. First of all, I'd say that they're getting, the stuff they're starting to put in them now are getting worse and worse. So the vaccines that are coming up are going to be more and more dangerous and they're going to be lowering the immune system. I, I personally believe that those people that died of COVID um, had a massive, there was a massive push for the flu vaccine last winter. However, we are all different. Yes, I totally agree we're all different. Some people will sail through anything. Some people can smoke 90 cigarettes a day. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, 100, but we're all different. However, I'd say that to me, I, I wouldn't cope with these things because I know you have to know yourself. You have to know your body. And that's why I'm, I don't say to other people, you know, there's always been a choice. I'm pro choice. Obviously yeah. about free speech and pro choice. If you want to have them, then it's up to you. But then I also watch my cat, Ellie. Ellie, Ellie had loads of vaccinations. When she came to us, she was a mess. And Peace, who was born more or less with us, had nothing, he had one as a kitten. And uh, Ellie was, was a mess and I healed her and she, she never went back again to the vet. And also we had another cat who was vaccinated and he went a lot younger. So I can see 
the difference in their coat. I can see, and now she's beautiful, she's gorgeous, because I changed, I, we healed each other, I healed her and she healed herself. But, oh. but I mean, take for example, you know, like this thing with, with Trump and the 5G, you know, like he didn't want the 5G from Hawaii, from China, but he, he's, he's okay that another type of 5G, right? Okay, well, first of all, everything that Trump says is coded. Um, I believe that 100%. Everything he says is coded, and this is coming through more and more now with the new information. Um, I believe in technology, yes, and I believe that technology needs to progress, but I don't think we need to do it with microwaves. And 5G is literally going to be like in a microwave, and it, it's just, I can't even have microwave food. So to me, it's going to be very dangerous to people like me. I'd say that the more detoxified you are, the worse it will be because your bodies are so clean. And unfortunately, those whose bodies, if you put a, a pill into me, like a Nurofen, um, I go, my body goes into shock because I have nothing in there. It's so detoxified. But I think that Trump talks in codes a lot of the time. Um, and I don't think he, he's agreeing to 5G at all. And the same way, but he has to get in. He has to get in and he has to keep certain people happy in order to get in. And that's how I believe this is happening. It's all unfolding like a chess game. But, you know, I'm, I've got a lot of contact with people like Mark Steele, who is putting out their stuff that children are getting nosebleeds, birds are dying, and he's got photographs of, of um, around the area where birds are dying and his whole campaign is about protecting us and to, i mean you know i'm just going to throw a little... microwave is not going to be conducive to my health and to i, I can't see how we how we could be healthy if we're if under... i mean i uh um just want to throw a little bit of a spanner in the works here and just throw in a bit of a difficult okay. question because i'm a, I was a member of a lot of different groups on facebook and i was a member of a native american indian uh, uh, group it was uh concerned for the sioux tribe and they were the ones at Standing Rock that were protesting that there was going to be an oil, um, you know, uh, tunnel or whatever going through that area. And it was going to disrupt the water. You know, they, they, they were protesting and they all got um, water gunned or something. This was right at the beginning of Trump's administration. And I remember when I was heavily involved in all the awakening online, I would go in and share stuff into that group. And they just didn't want to know. They just don't want to know anything about Trump. You know, they don't like the way they were treated. Uh, American Indians have been hit really hard by COVID. Um, and, you know, a lot of them have died and stuff. And, and, and I just kind of like, there was this disparity between, you know, this kind of like awakening thing about, you know, sort of, you know, the QAnon and, and kind of like that we're moving into this great awakening. And then, you know, you'd expect that in a group like that, that, you know, maybe they'd, they'd sort of, pick it up or, or whatever, but they were just really anti-Trump because of what he did at Standing Rock. I don't know. All I know is he picked up a lot of a mess, um, but I know that now whatever he's doing, he's doing for the good of humanity. And I've had these discussions with so many people now that he could be from the future, he could be an alien for all we know, um, but I, I trust it. I trust it and I trust Q. Um, I can't really say anything about that because I don't know enough about that. Uh, but this is my opinion. And as I say, the, the beauty, I, what I want Moving On TV to be, and I'm glad you're asking me these questions because you have a right to, is for everyone to have free speech but not harm humanity or, or harm the environment. I mean, someone said to me the other day, how are you going to get rich? Are you going to take on the big globalist companies to sponsor you? I said, well, no way. <laughs> I'd rather not make anything than have that lot on board. You see, people don't always get the consciousness that I'm trying to promote here. But yeah, you, everyone has a right. You see, this is why Facebook has no right to cut people off, like me, if I say Heil Hitler. They have no right to do that. Since when do you cut someone off when they say, instead of clapping the NHS, shout Heil Hitler? I'm entitled to my opinion. But that maybe what maybe what we need is a more enlightened <laughs> kind of consciousness in the world where people sort of don't take everything, every little word, you know, people kind of like, you know, in this day and age, we live in an age where 
you know, you've got to be so careful what you say. And it never used to be like that. You know, it was like you could sort of have more of a laugh before and it was that people sort of had a bit more of a sense of humor. But like mm. now, you know, it's like everything's so PC and you've just got to be so careful not to upset anybody. And do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's been a, prog a, a progression of the cabal. They've been destroying us bit by bit. They've been taking away our fun. They've been taking away our free speech. And I mean, you couldn't say that I, the other day, I've, I had to think before I said, that, oh, I thought you were black. I saw this girl and she was pale, her skin was pale. And yet when I saw her on Facebook, I thought she was black. And I had to think, am I saying something racist? Well, what can I say? Um, I thought you were a Negro. Uh, I thought you were a mixed I thought black was acceptable to say. Well, some people find it like Baba Black Sheep. Some people find that offensive. Yeah, yeah. If someone says to me, you're a Jew, Okay, I mean, so what? It's just the word, you know? It doesn't, I mean, people yeah. had this message, which was really interesting, from a bunch, of, these people are called Lovers One, and I did a big interview with them. And there's all this stuff about the Jews, the Jews are Zionists, and a lot of them, yeah, are mixed up in the cabal. But I'm an ordinary Jew. I just happened to be born into that religion. And I said to them, you've got to be careful. I, what you say to me here because I'm Jewish, you know, and, and uh, they kind of backed off a bit. But it, it, I think basically our, our fun was spoiled. Um, they, everything, all the what was happening was everything was about legality, health and safety, nonsense. And they put the fear of you in every single way. And it's all about fear, 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 fear of being um, uh, sued fear of the virus fear of going out fear of not wearing a mask fear where it, it just progressed the virus is fear and fear is false emotion appearing real and i did not have one ounce of fear when this virus came out i called it doris remember because i believed if i called it i mean there's been times where i've said to people things like oh well you know there's only like a less than one percent chance of you know actually dying from it and they were like well do you know how much that is of the actual population and I suppose if you were to take, you know, 1% of the global population, which is like the 6 billion on the planet, mm. and that 1% actually did die, that would be quite a lot of million. Um, and then if, if they hadn't, I mean, you know, if they hadn't put these measures in, let's just run with the argument that it is contagious. And um, then, you know, and it had spread. It could, have, it could have killed a lot of people if you're going to go with that, that side of the argument. Um, I mean, it does seem like a crazy thing to have, like, for 0.01% to have killed the entire economy. But you and I both know that like, if we're gonna move into something better, that old system had to die. And at mm -hmm. the moment, mm -hmm. you know, if you, it, look, it feels as though we're just gonna ease back into that old system again. Do you know what I mean? No, we're not. I mean, I, the conversation I have with Charlie Ward, I, I'm going to put that out as soon as I can get it edited. It's really interesting because he explained exactly how this happened. Charlie Ward uh, used to be a security or a security guy that used to, that would move money for the royals and the rich and famous. And over the last six years, he explained to me, this is going to happen in 2021. It was all planned, but it was going to happen differently. They were going to crash the economy and end the system and bring in this Nisara and Gesara. However, Unfortunately, the bad guys got there first and they released the virus in Wuhan and that's how all this happened. But it got intercepted. Thank God it got intercepted. And Trump has now got, the, uh, the Chinese president is now with him and India. They're all working with Trump. Q, there's about 8,000 of them in Q now. And, but it can't go backwards. It's impossible. But as I said, we don't rest on our laurels. We have to take action. And if they don't listen to us about not putting out these 5G towers, I'm, I'm going to be calling all the providers and I'm going to present them with the evidence. There's offers and petitions going to the government because that is the way of how they build the immune system so that they can easily um, make a lot of people sick they're fighting back. However, 
we are winning and because people are waking up every day every day through the 5g thing through understanding all the lies and the confusion and the misconception of this virus and also if uh, people are coming out like in italy they came out and they admitted 99 percent of people that died nearly every single person had underlying diabetes and other conditions and that's why they died not from this virus they died from other conditions because their immune system was so low and that's what it's all about and as i said the uh, i'm willing to bet that the when i speak to old people that didn't have vaccinations like um, the lady was in the hospital with me eileen she's 95 i think she wouldn't let them vaccinate her she's perfectly well nothing wrong with her martin's family uh, his parents loads of people they never had any vaccinations they have really healthy diets with vitamins they don't overwork they don't have underlying conditions so yeah. you can look at the full picture here this virus was a wake-up call and i did say this and because we're waking up we don't need anything else it cannot happen again we now need to take back our governments we need to take back our world because that's it we have no choice we have to and at some point we were going to destroy the whole planet anyway and so the planet has had time to breathe and there's no way people can go back there's been so many awakenings i mean citizen journalism has become huge now like myself and and that's when you know interviewing charlie Ward today and i said to you know he's a, now a citizen uh He's a citizen. Okay, but there still is a lot of contention over this 5G. I mean, I live with somebody who works with, with this kind of stuff, and basically, he just, he just, he just says it's 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 completely hyped, and that that it's it, you know, as far as he's concerned, it's not dangerous. So, you know, it's, it's very very hard to 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 really you know, unless you're somebody that actually understands the the full um, sort of process of how it works. To well, really, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, come to some conclusion about that. But um, anyway, what, what I've learned about five G over the years, it, it, it's it can't be good for us. We're not talking about one tower; it's a conglomerate. It's literally like little microwaves, little microwaves that are going to be beaming on top of us. And uh, whoever this is, uh, you're talking about your partner. They have to look at the scientific evidence and they have to look at the 150 scientists and doctors that have proven how dangerous it is. And that's, you know, there's loads of evidence out there. And when there's that much evidence, but then like I say, my gut is telling me, because as I say, if I can be affected by 5G as much as I am, then there's 5G, then there's 6, then there's 10. Where does this go? How much radiation? I mean, it's radiation. They give you radiation to burn you inside to kill cancer, which is, to me is completely wrong anyway. It, just, it doesn't work and it's wrong. But that's what radiation is. 5G is radiation. And why would I want radiation? Would you? I don't want it. And okay, say, say we agree to have... It's a very, very low frequency. It's much, much lower than what they use in okay. microwaves. Yes. It, it has to be within a very low spectrum. <coughs> <coughs> Huh? Say okay. Say we agree. Yeah, okay. I'm ha but they need to do tests on it first. They need to test it first. And what we're asking is, we're asking the government to hold the rollout until they've tested it. And they need to test it first because we have a right to ask for that. And I think everyone is the same as a mandatory vaccine. Uh, if people want to have five G, then let them have it. But this is different. This is going to be. I mean, Mark Steele has put out there, don't let your kids go back to school because while the schools were closed, and I'm interviewing him tomorrow, while the schools were closed, they've been putting up 5G around the schools and he reckons the kids are going to be, they're going to kill them. And he is so adamant about this. Now, whether he's... That's creating a lot of fear though, isn't it? Know. Pardon? That's creating a lot of fear. It's creating a lot of fear, but it's also making people wake up. And sometimes, do you know what, Angie? If I hadn't got a lot of tough love in the therapeutic community, I would not have woken up. My biggest awakenings happened because of tough love. And that's the truth. 
And I don't think we've got time. From everyone that I'm speaking to and interviewing, yes, there is a, a new future coming, but we're not, able, we're not able to lay on our laurels and do nothing. We sit there and meditate all day. It's not going to make it happen. We unite and we stand up and we say we do not consent. I do not want any more. I mean, they've been bombarding us with God knows what through geoengineering, lowering our immune system for so long now. And I know this is true. There's loads of evidence. And someone put something out the other day and she said, well, we haven't got a chance in hell. She said, I've already been bombarded by aluminium and mercury and continuously, continuously. Yeah, but how do, they, how do these so-called elites protect themselves from all this stuff? Well, they have, they have probably got uh, Adrenochrome, maybe. Maybe that's what Adrenochrome is. Maybe it gives them back this awful practice that they do. There must be a way because they're not going to kill themselves, are they? But, I mean, how, would they, how do they protect themselves from 5G? Maybe, I, mean, I, don't you know. Know. I don't know. I mean, again, that's something I'd have to think about and ask. Okay, all right. Well, anyway, listen, I think, yeah. I think we, need to, we need to wind it up, start winding yeah, it up. Because, it's uh, exciting because, it, yeah, we, uh, tomorrow I'm bringing on Mark Steele and he's talking about, he goes very far and he says that we can't have any metals in our body at all. He's coming out against collodial silver. So again, he, it, it, totally outrageous, huge amount of stuff. And then you've got um, people that collodial silver is really good for you. We're living in a, in a consciousness where there's a huge amount of confusion. Um, you have to trust your gut. That's it. And, and there's some things that I know. There's some things that I trust that I've developed over years and years and years and years that my gut tells me literally, um, I can't eat that or that's not good for me. Careful, Lauren. And because your intuition gets very strong. And the other day, I mean, when even Martin, my husband, was scared last week because I was so sick from the EMF and from the 4G. And we turned everything off and went into nature. I dosed up on vitamin C and some black seed oil and got loads of oxygen. And then we turned it back on again and I was okay. So to me, that's proof, Angie. That is proof that 4G for someone like me is already, it's not what it, it, it's affecting me. I remember when I got my phone, I was burning up just from holding it. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, as I say, I think it's an individual thing, but I have a lot of respect for the people that are setting up petitions. And I don't think we should put anything near us until it's tested. Since when did that change? When did that change? I mean, sure. All right, well. Um... <laughs> done on things, didn't they? I mean, didn't tests used to be done before they put something out to the public? They test them. Like makeup, got, you know, horrible tests on animals, but they tested stuff. What now they decide from now on, we're not, we're just going to do whatever we want. No, I don't think it's okay. I think that is a, that is giving them a signal to say we consent. And the minute we say we consent, then they'll walk all over us. And that's not going to be good, <laughs> but it's been amazing. And I hope that I was able to get through here, um, that you just get out there and you, you, you live your dream. So stop thinking about what everybody else thinks doesn't matter what they think it's your life start doing what you love if martin didn't agree with what i was doing and a lot of time we, we do disagree on a lot of things i just thank god thank god i've got enough people now that i can contact and say you know i don't know what to do martin is not he's not you know in the same consciousness at the moment and and i'll talk to someone else or i'll take myself away or i'll do a program or i'll do an awakening where i'll say I'm struggling here because I can't cope because someone's got a different opinion to me. How am I going to deal with it? And of course, that comes from the childhood again. It comes yeah. from the child that was abused that no one listened to her. I think about it. So it's an amazing time. And I believe that if we really, really put all our energy, we're all goddesses and we're all got this capacity to build the beautiful world that we want. And, and maybe that's a good way to end. Like, <laughs> yes okay so, yeah thank you so much and 
Okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. And um, yeah, look forward to uh, you know seeing it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay.